The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to this first webinar of the Beyond BIM series. So the selected topic for today is how the system leads the change in infrastructure design and project delivery. My name is Frédéric Droit from the system and I'm very, very happy to be introducing today's webinar. So before we begin, I'd like to first mention that attendees are muted and will remain muted uh, during the webinar due to the amount of participants that we have. And uh, one of our objectives is to engage discussion with this audience. So please, at any time, use the question window located in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. If you have comments, if you disagree or agree with what we're saying, or if you have any question, uh, tell us if you think we have missed something. We're very interested by your feedback. As your moderator, I'll do my best to relay questions uh, and comments to the speaker. Uh, and if we can cover your comments uh, during this webinar, I personally commit in uh, doing a uh, follow-up to provide uh, answers to uh, everyone. Note that the session is being recorded and will be uh, made available shortly on demand at 3ds.com. Uh, now, uh, before introducing our speaker, let me quickly recap why we are here today. Several studies show that there is very limited productivity growth and over the last two decades in the construction industry, in addition, in view of the risk, the margin is somehow low. Uh, McKinsey and company tells us that the industry expect the change to come quickly and to be radical. And today's speaker will explain how Dassault system is avoiding failures of the BIM concept, which is not able to manage the complexity of infrastructure projects and constant change you have to go through uh, during a project, so making the adoption of BIM uh, difficult and challenging. We will see how a real common data environment and data-driven environment opposed to pinpoint solution or document-based uh, environment is leading actually to redundant uh, rework. Our speaker will also explain how this real common data environment, or we could use the term platform here, uh, is not limited to a single project view or part of the process. It needs to cover all projects, uh, full end-to-end -end process. Otherwise, you actually limit the ability not only to manage change, but to ensure that everyone can contribute uh, uh, in the platform in capturing knowledge, uh, sharing it, controlling it, reuse it, but also to make it actionable. I'll stop myself here and let our speaker talk to it and, and show also this audience what it means to go beyond BIM. So today, Kurt, um, Kurt Ameringer uh, from the Source System will revisit for us the three items we have just seen, uh, which is really our opportunity here to transform the industry. He has great expertise and great understanding of the reason why Pinpoint Solution or this articulated type of platform failed in transforming the industry. As for Olivier Gallifet from SNC Lavalin, he will tell us how SNC initiated this transformation, uh, but also his story, what what was the benefit for him uh, in adopting uh, this type of solution, but also for his coworker, manager, uh, adopting a 3D experience, 3D experience uh, which is a Dassault system solution. So for those who don't know Dassault system, we're a purpose-driven company. This means that we develop solution to go beyond the current need of the industry, that we don't acquire technology to acquire market share, that we acquire technology actually to acquire knowledge and talents uh, to redevelop the solution and have it fully integrated in our uh, data-driven platform. And because our objective remains to partner with the industry and engage this transformation, and we've done it initially for Aerospace a few decades ago and after Automotive, and now we are engaging the same fashion for construction and life science. We're 20,000 people passionate about science with a global R&D presence. And the reason why SNC Lavanet is here today as well uh, there are 50,000 uh, passionate people about engineering, but they are also a purpose-driven company. Change is not easy. It's, not, it's really a matter of not losing sight of the strategy while paying attention to the details, right, of in executing this transformation. And my story, my personal story with SNC is a great one, really inspiring. Uh, they have a great culture of innovation. And I thought it was interesting to highlight how they have engaged on the sustainability uh, topic which is a very trendy topic, but they took a very uh, pragmatic approach uh, to do significant change uh, and uh, leveraging the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, that we're seeing here uh, as a way to set objective and ensure that they can meet them uh, uh, 
through a significant and progressive approach. So now I'll stop myself here and turn it over to Kurt, uh, which will provide you with a quick overview of 3D experience uh, fundamental concepts. So on this, Kurt, the stage is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, Fred. And as Fred mentioned, we're going to just do a quick kind of overview of the uh, the 3D experience fundamentals before I turn this over to SNC. And then we're going to circle back and see if we can answer some additional questions after that. But just as a quick background, when Fred mentions the 3D experience or this idea of a platform, I want to be very specific. This isn't just a, a process or a solution for sharing files. Um, we have a very different way of approaching technology. And in that, all of the project data, whatever it may be, is housed in this integrated experience. And the compass that you see here on the upper left of my screen grab actually navigates to all the various points or apps that we use to be able to manipulate this information. So again, if you think about opening a file in an authoring tool and wanting to be able to manipulate that, you know, you have a dedicated set of tools that are purpose built in your point solution to author. Well, when we click on our West Quadrants up here, we access all of the authoring apps that are available on our platform and we're able to populate that information. If I decide that I want to run through an analysis of that data, simulation of some sort, I can simply click on that compass again, going to the South Quadrant and access a whole host of apps that change the tools that I'm working with at any given moment to enable me to be able to run through multiple types of simulation or virtual reality or whatever I want to do to, to you know, query that 3D model. So I'm not writing out a file, I'm not creating an artifact, I'm not orphaning data at that point. I'm always working on the latest and greatest. And as I want to carry that forward and possibly go out and look at activities and tasks that are organized here, we can go to that north quadrant of the compass. And this is our collaboration environment. You can think of it almost as a social media type of approach to how we coordinate the information and activities that are happening on the project. And then if I move to my east quadrant, as I click on that, I get a wealth of information available to be able to go in and query everything on the job. So it may be all the 3D data, but it can also be the schedule. It can be the activities, the people involved, the history. All of that's available to us, again, in this one consistent, unified environment. So with that suite of apps, we have an end-to-end -end solution that's available to go from concept all the way through design, into fabrication, construction, you know, optimizing the performance, and even into maintenance of being able to leverage this data. But we also realize that you've made an investment, an uh, investment in time, in people, uh, process, the tools that you have today. And so we want to be able to consume that information. You want to be able to take the BIM that you generate, take the schedule that you populated, take the tasks, the activities, the cut sheets, in whatever formats they may be, and bring all that together into this 3D experience, at which point we can start linking it so that when you click on a piece of geometry, you're not just looking at the shape or the metadata, the attributes, you could even see where that exists in the construction sequence schedule, where that exists as a task of the decision tree that was made to get us to that point in the design. And really we wanna make this data accessible to everybody that's working on the project as appropriate to their task. So you can think about that as moving from BIM into what we coined a digital twin experience on the 3D experience platform. And I think through the presentation today, you'll be able to see how we're providing flexibility and traceability to really limit the amount of risk that you have with whatever aspect of this process that you're engaged in, and ideally improve the way that you're delivering the specifics of what you're delivering to the project. And to that end, I'm gonna say this a few times during the presentation, we really wanna support the entire ecosystem of companies that design, deliver, and maintain the entire environment in which we live. That's, you know, that's everything from the product manufacturer that's making a light switch, all the way up to you know, the entire city or state that you're living in. And we'll show you some examples of that today. So with that being said, I'm gonna invite my colleague here, Olivier, to join us from SNC. As um, Fred mentioned, Olivier has quite an extensive background working in infrastructure design and has been working on the 3D experience for quite a number of years as well. So Olivier, I'm going to turn this over and the floor is yours. Thank you, Kurt. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. Let's start uh, with a video. My colleague, Christophe Segarra, and I started to make research and development 
uh, in September 2017. The target was to discover what Trudy experience was capable of and how we can propose a better way of working to our team. We decided to create a video with conceptual representation of a major project showing what we can do and how we can do it. Everything you see on the screen was modeled with Katia, even the soil, the mountains, the sea, buildings and skyscraper. We modeled everything we need in our division. We can see track, rails, track slippers, switches, elevated guideway, stormwater management, road, tunnel, overhead catenary system, uh, corridor with different layer of ballast and sub-ballast systems like bug bands, a wonderful cable state bridge and construction simulation. What you can see on this video looks like a commercial view, but it's not. It's a real engineering content. You can count each track zipper, count the length of the rail and their weight. It, in this case, it's 14 kilometers of track. You can count also the quantity of excavation, refill and backfill and the volume of concrete. Everything is linked to the alignment uh, of the track. So in case of a modification of the path, you can run an update and all the representation and quantity are going to be changed. Another very interesting, interesting thing is if you need to bid for feasibility study, for example, a big project, big project as we are on the screen. The staff of 3D model ensure you a lot of things. You can get the quantity, you have the feasibility in 3D and not in 2D. This way you can reduce a lot of engineering problems from the beginning. You have the capacity to make revision to your bid asking by the customer, it's fast and easy. You have a wonderful visual support for your commercial proposal. If you get the project, you just can continue working on your 3D. You don't need to restart everything from scratch. And finally, the speed to obtain all that is amazing. It took 400 man hours to create uh, what you are seeing, engineering and rendering included. So on the top of that, you can add the same quantity of time for estimator and bid team. Finally, you get proposal for less than a thousand hour work. I repeat this point, uh, uh, it's for feasibility study. I'm going back to explain how this can be done. All of this is possible because of the powerful tool which our engineering template. They give the possibility to embed your engineering knowledge in smart tool in order to automate the tree production. With the following video, I'll explain how it works. One of the best examples is the OCS domain. The engineering is very complicated. There's a lot of components. They all look like the same, but they are not. There are a lot of opportunities to clash, to clash with the train, services, bridges, station, and so on. The contact wire and the pole are always specific and different location in order for, to follow the, the technical requirement. Doing a 3D mock-up with an old school methodology is nonsense. Too many possibilities of human uh, mistake. With automated, automated tool, you can produce an update very quickly in a safe way. The most important thing is we create this, uh, this tool based on real engineering with our engineering engineers and their knowledge. Everything is fully embedded on it. It's difficult for an engineer to validate a huge 2D model. Now they can do it easily and take the responsibility to stamp and sign their design. Our smart tools are simply built with the native capability of CATIA UDF engineering template. You can see on the video how we can switch from a configuration to another and how we uh, change the sizes of element. In between two poles, we can have 200 different possibility of configuration. We can play with all elements, foundation, the catenaries, the tensioner, and so on. First step, we use parameters. Uh, we can manage them with design table to create element. Uh, second step, with product table, uh, we can create element configuration. Third step with uh, data setup, we can create configuration families. And for sure, we link all that through our engineering template. Now I'm going to explain how we can manage and run this huge quantity of uh, configuration. 
this part of this video is showing that we can use at the end a simple Excel tab to run automatically the 3D production without any human activity. The Excel tab is linked to 3D experience and we can link whatever we want in terms of parameters, configuration, UDF, engine template, etc. This means to initiate a design, we no longer need a full design team to start a project. An engineer can fill out the tab and initiate all the criteria he wants to see appearing on the screen. Once the first tab is launched, we can uh, work on another one and Katia produce the 3D in masked time. We can also integrate because we need for construction an automated creation of 2D drawing with bill of materials for each pole. Think about the time saving when we are talking about 2,000 uh, pole or more OCS pole uh, in a project. It's very, uh, it's very huge and uh, it's uh, amazing as gain of time, finally. Now let's talk about other domain after you can see on, on the screen it's a drawing I just uh, talk about. So you just have to update the view for each poll, just a simple update and you obtain like 2000 drawing automatically, automatically uh, created. You have uh, as a bit of material here and that's it. So uh, uh, Kurt, you can turn the video, thank you. Now let's talk about uh, other domain. We can create our own native alignment by creating a plan alignment and elevated alignment. At the end, Katia combine both to create a 3D alignment. I want to highlight that DASO was supportive to our needs by creating a landed XML converter to turn AutoCAD CV 3D alignment into native Katia alignment. Super version and Kent. My colleague Christophe has developed a manual way to obtain the Kent. He shared a lot of his work with Aaron Dasso in France and now this option is available. Trackworks. On the same approach as the Super version, Christophe has created templates to produce corridor. Corridor is the area on which the track is installed, based on the alignment, the Kent and the terrain. The power of this tool is that you can all at once create different layers of materials with civil work, excavation, backfill and refill. You can add anything that follows the track as needed. It could be duck bank or piping, whatever. LOG, we can easily change the level of detail of the exposed element. Remember on the first video, we were working on a feasibility study. At this step, we didn't need to uh, show a high level of detail. Now you win the contract. You can continue working on the same mock-up and increase automatically the level of detail because it's embedded in your tool anyway. Structure. For bridges, we have developed our own automated template to easily create elevated guideway and bridges. We have covered piers, deck, bearing, foundation, and so on. We made template for concrete structure and steel structure. Everything takes in account the alignment and the Kent. The video shows the result of an automated tools uh, used to model bridges along several kilometers uh, for a project. As I already said, because we are on a linear design linked to the alignment, the, the video shows now how Katia manage modification. Trust me, it's happened quite often during a life cycle of a project. See where the added value is time saving. All disciplines, bridge, OCS, rail, track, sleeper, and so on, react the same way during an update. And you can now see the result of an automated uh, tool created uh, for uh, safety barriers along uh, an elevated guideway made with another software. I will tell you more about collaboration later in the presentation. This part of this video is now showing how we can do complex automated tools with templates. The first point is that we can combine templates producing concrete and steel, for instance. The second point is 
that you can embed several CATIA apps in a template. Here it's a complex template using the steel structure app and remember every single part you see are created automatically. You can see the level of detail we reach and think again about time saving. The first point is if you can add, if you can add if you want element coming from the piping or the electrical uh, app in the template. Now let's talk about other technical added value for a project. Uh, you can switch uh, Kurt uh, on, on the slide. Thank you. That's the first one. The possibility to load a large one cloud survey allow me to define the environment of a large existing underground station. The management of two billion points give us after meshing surfaces the possibility to start our engineering for two tracks of 800 meters each and two tracks of 500 meters each. This from the beginning of the project. The first picture shows the reality on site. The second shows the pond cloud loaded. The third shows the result of meshed surfaces. Trade experience is powerful to allow this kind of action. With a 3D rendering good and accurate enough uh, to navigate and allow us to design in context. It was easy to select and isolate the needed area where we wanted to intervene. Uh, next slide please, Kurt. And the, uh, once the environment is acquired, it's simple to start modeling and process dimensional analysis. I can highlight two added value. The first is we can define the elevation of the contact wire, the electrical train supplying, and be sure we have no clash with the environment. Then define which kind of work we need to do on this existing station in terms of track works, silver works and concrete work. Do we have to demolish and rebuild the platform? Uh, do we have to change the height of the track? So many questions answered uh, quickly early in the design process. A huge time and money saving. The second added value is that several disciplines can start working at the same time early in the timeline of uh, the project and in context. Uh, next. Thank you. Historically speaking, uh, the design of uh, the station started in 1930 and never ended since today. From the, the original 2D drawings, the existing uh, station 3D uh, was made and we got access to it a long period after the day one of the project. So time had come to do the crash detection. As you can see on these pictures, the design made in the context of the 3D station is not always relevant to reality and the large pond cloud assistance allowed us to do a double check and detect some mistake due to improper human action during the production of the 3D of the station. Once again, it is time saving, cost saving with a high added quality value. Next, please, Kurt. Construction came to us asking for help. They were not able to produce some concrete print because of the complexity of rebars. Too many clashes in the rebar cage. The 2D uh, drawings provided were not accurate enough for construction. Katia allowed us to create 3D uh, of complex rebar. And at the end, we extracted a new bunch of drawing to help them build. Because rebars in CATIA are made of engineering templates, they can morph based on surfaces references and they can follow complex paths. It was easy to create variation of shape along the post-tensioning cables. It was also easy to copy and paste the rebar done and make it adaptable to other beam with different section. Again, it's time saving, cost saving with a high added quality value. Uh, next slide. As I have already spoken rather than the presentation, by using our smart tool for corridors, we can create junction of tracks with complex geometry of material layers and civil work. 
you can see uh, different colors showing the width and uh, the thickness variation combined. This is the same approach I did with OCS team. Here we work with track work engineer to capture all the engineering for this domain and embedded it in uh, an automatic tool. Please remember again the first video, our feasibility study. When you use this type of template from the beginning, you can extract accurate data for quantity. Save time at the creation and a lot when you uh, want to update things. Uh, next uh, slide. Now some word to tell you about integration uh, in a project. Everyone knows the capability level of truly experience as an integrated BIM platform and we all prefer to work within a single platform. But depending on the project, organization or contractor, this is not always possible. The company uh, you need to work with don't necessarily have a true experience. With the following slide, I just want to demystify the legendary uh, complexity of Katia. A lot of people think it's for aerospace only and it's too complicated for AC. In fact, in fact, it's not. It's very easy to share and communicate with other software. On the project I'm working for, this integration is done in another software. Let's call it Software X for this presentation. On this project, I never face a problem to share data back and forth with our partners. Uh, you can switch. Oh, thank you. On this uh, slide, you can see that uh, we can find a 3D, uh, that we can find on 3D experience all the data necessary to do uh, correct design. And on the software X, all the imported elements done in Katia. You recognized on the previous picture the beam with its complex rebar and the bridge we saw before. You recognize also the OCS pool with cable tray for a substation connection. On this picture now, you can see rigid OCS in a tunnel station. The environment is quite crowded. I did the connection between the electrical supply coming from the station cable done with software X and my OCS done in Katia. See uh, blue cables connected to uh, gray cables for uh, example. I always do my clash detection in uh, 3D experience between uh, discipline I want to. This way I'm sure to deliver a clean 3D model for project coordination. Uh, you can switch please. So uh, the last following slide show interfaces with existing structure and OCS. It's uh, easy to help construction with uh, sequencing temporary works or and to simulate uh, optional solution. You can extract quantity and compare them to find the best action to put in place. Uh, I think I have two minutes left for a short personal uh, conclusion. I'm not a software vendor, I'm just a 3D beam modeler at SNC Labala. And I've just presented to you, let's say, my daily comfort of working. I'm the only OCS 3D modeler working for my team uh, in this project. I can manage all types of OCS, the additional equipment needed to connect them to substation. I covering uh, something like 50 kilometers and 19 stations. I always able to give more information to construction team, such as a list of geolocated points uh, for each uh, OCS support, even before the OCS supplier uh, himself start working on it. With a large uh, pond cloud, I can see things that no one can see with uh, other software. The added value of uh, using 3D experience is large, but at the end we can summarize it at, as a time saving and an insurance to do your design with a perfect accuracy in the respect of your engineering. As I said, the best solution is to produce everything on the same uh, platform and take advantage of 
all the type of management you can find onto it, such as lifecycle management uh, or uh, interoperability and so on. I cover it as a 3D uh, design aspect only, but there is so much more our experience can offer. Kurt will uh, broaden the scope from here. But I would like you all to remember these uh, three key points from my presentation. Uh, design automation improves our speed and quality. We can manage 3D complexity at great scale, uh, recall 50 kilometers of track. The integrated environment helps with collaboration across our project team. So thank you uh, for your attention and I hope my presentation will help you to see that this is real and available. I hope uh, you will now there and be curious to uh, learn more about uh, 3D experience. Kurt, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier, and I am continually in awe of the amount of uh, work you're able to get accomplished here and the level of detail at which you're working is just uh, astounding time and time again. So thank you very much for sharing your stories with us today. So as Olivier was showcasing some of the, uh, the process and methodologies that they're able to deploy at SNC, um, there's a lot more that we could be talking about today from again, collaboration, uh, simulation, an analysis, analytics, from the standpoint of time, I thought we could take the next few moments to kind of look at almost a day in the life, if you will, of how we're able to take advantage of this uh, automated engineering at a level of construction or even manufacturing detail. And talk again about that idea of the scalability and complexity that we're able to manage. But I wanna focus on this idea of collaboration and how that might look moving forward. So if I were to launch the 3D experience, I wanna keep keep in mind that we're talking about this compass and again the ability to navigate and so as i start off with this you can see here the compass sitting in the upper left corner it tells me that i'm sitting on my dashboard and this actually is where myself and the other uh, 20,000 passionate co-workers at the DeSoto systems start most of our mornings we actually use this technology and this process in our day-to-day -day activities so as fred and i are comparing notes and sharing information about this Later in the week, we'll be populating that information into this environment so that it can be, again, shared with the rest of our team. But just starting off here, as I'm on my dashboard, I'm actually looking at a project breakdown structure of all of the different components that are uh, available in, in this given model. And you can see the 3D visualization as well. Uh, this is available in a web browser, so you can launch it from your desktop, you can launch it from the cloud, however you choose to, but you don't have to necessarily have the authoring tools to be able to consume the information. And so as I'm looking at this, I'm going to coordinate with the rest of my project team. And so starting off, we have some issues that need to be addressed. Um, out of the gate, I'm just going to create a blank issue. This could be populated from a template, again, so we can start uh, ensuring consistency in our standards and our communication, which you know, provides it to be invaluable three years from now when somebody comes back and there's a surprise on the project and we want to figure out exactly how that, that happened. Well, from here, we can create that issue and simply by then defining what the task is, we type that in, I'm gonna, you know, much like we would in an email, start the conceptual design phase of the project. I can then identify a priority, you know, where does it fall within the scale of how quickly we need to get to it. I can associate a due date and then add whatever additional information I want. Because we're in the 3D experience, it's not just an email. This is actually all of the information necessary to potentially do my task. So in this case, we've selected the assembly, the components, the sub-assembly, whatever elements you want and associate the, the activity. So now rather than maybe getting a screenshot with some red lines on it or some written instructions, you can go to this location, I'm populating that, that kit of parts to address this task. And then I can identify a, a responsible party and send that information across, at which point I now have a pending issue that needs to be managed in some capacity. So I can open that and change it from a pending situation to be an active situation, at which point it goes live. And this is part of the gate structure so that we can have a continuous improvement in our methodologies and process. As we move through the activities, we can 
send it back for review. We can push it forward, pull it back. Again, have that traceability and that methodology of managing our deliverables. Okay. So from that standpoint, my colleague who is across town at his home, another state, another country, shows up and sees on his dashboard that he has a series of tasks that are due. And so simply, again, by selecting the task, he gets all the information that I populated, who put it together, when it's assigned, what specifically it is. And by activating that, it automatically carries all that additional information. So again, I don't have to go searching to figure out exactly what it was that I'm, I need to be working with. As soon as I see that task, I have access to everything necessary to engage that. So at this point, again, I'm looking at this from a browser standpoint, and I can see the geometry and the components necessary to be addressed. So given that I've been asked to start the conceptual design phase of the project, I might do something like launch our X-Generative Design Solution. And this is a, you know, again, native application on the platform. It would be accessed from that West Quadrant, again, that I mentioned earlier on the compass. And as you look at that compass, again, you can see now we're on our dashboard and we're you know, in an engineering environment. But as you look across the board, you can see that 3D generative innovator, which is the name of the actual app that I'm now using. And so this is a conceptual tool, uh, purpose built for construction. And with the selection set that I have right now, you can actually see a whole series of sliders or, or controllers that I can manipulate. And this is great because when uh, somebody like myself gets into the authoring space, I may not have the expertise to be able to go in and create all of these things, but through the pick list, I can very quickly lay out and manipulate based on the level of design that I want to. So this is a, basically, it's a 3D pattern shape creator. And again, it becomes very simple to manipulate and create that conceptual design. Um, I may not have mentioned it is a, a native web app. So this is actually available in my internet browser. I don't have to have any local hardware installed. And I just simply go to the 3D experience and launch the app and I'm authoring. And that enables me to create really a, a library or content of intelligent components. So we're looking at component-based design. As I look at that alignment running down the center of this, this bridge, all of these components are being attached to that alignment. And in the process of design, we're actually creating templates that can then be reused downstream. As Olivier mentioned, you know, they're able to take the templates that they created for one job and potentially solve another design problem on the same site with them, but also carry them across project to project, leveraging kind of their best practice knowledge, their you know, internal IP to be able to speed the time that we can get to delivering a highly detailed model. So I have these template components. And you know, if you're one of those folks that enjoys the complex environment, uh, we, uh, we do have the graph editor that you can get in and manipulate from the standpoint of the attributes. Again, I tend to stay over on the left side of the screen, but the distinction is that the graph on the right is driving the geometry on the left. As I manipulate the geometry on the left, it's automatically updating the graph on the right. And I'm not having to do any kind of a synchronization or baking or updating process. All of this is happening in real time as I'm manipulating. So I have the flexibility to work where I want to with the appropriate tools to deliver the results that I want to get. So I'm not constrained to having to do something in a given environment. And quite frankly, we could even go so far as we suggested earlier to import geometry or tasks or activities that were populated in other tools. They can be able to link that together. So as we come back to this environment, you can see here again where we're now looking at multiple kilometers of, uh, of the site. Again, this was modeled natively on the platform, but it could have been imported from another tool we're able to then identify that alignment and start um, you know, carrying our information forward. Now, at this point, we've actually stepped into a, a higher level of detail within the, the app that we're using. So one of the nice things about the um, exterior design is it's very light and very fast. As I want to be able to then add additional load, I'm not constrained by you know, having to continue in that space. I can change the app. And again, it changes the tool set around what I'm doing. So at this point, I can leverage those smart components that we created to be able to apply those to this alignment and carry more information forward. And obviously we still have access to all the parameters to be able to manipulate this however we choose. And that can be you know, 
the entire collective or individual elements. So as I'm looking at that, you know, here we're making a sweeping change across the uh, the length of the deck segments, going in and changing the variable section information. So you can see where we have a consistent bottom here. We simply change a parameter and it updates that global constraint across all of these elements. So running through multiple design iterations becomes you know, quite seamless. And most importantly, from my perspective is while I'm doing this, I'm not stopping to save off a file to create an artifact snapshot over a moment in time. Uh, I have traceability down to the attributes of all the objects. So at any point I can roll back my design, I can pull it forward, I can look at three or four different things all within that same data point. And I'm not then having to go through this you know, jumping hoops of, of um, managing file and exporting information. So as well, as I mentioned, we can create uh, and manage individual components. So if we find that there's a one-off that needs to be manipulated, you know, by all means, let's do that. And then let's decide, do we wanna capture that one-off for use again later somewhere else, or do we wanna leave it as a unique instance? We have the flexibility to do both. So as we carry that across, we can also start to look at the level of detail or the level of development that we're working on the project. Um, since we started this in a conceptual environment, we've been working primarily with surfaces, which is great to be able to get in quickly and again, make large sweeping design changes and have that fluidity of not having to detail and carry all that information. But when it comes time to do that, we can actually automate the addition of that data. And so simply by selecting a given object, you can see here in the profile, it's just a surface. I can automate adding the actual physicality to that. So we've applied a template that says this is a concrete element and you can actually see the level of detail is increased where now we're looking at the sloping components of the bridge deck and so forth that aren't in the attached components. If we look inside, you can see the actual thickness and so forth. And all of this is based on those kind of engineering templates that we've assigned. So we take our best practice information that says, you know, we know from history and we know from the tables, this is the size we need to get. This is being applied for me automatically. And in the same capacity as we want to populate the rebar inside of that, we do the same thing. You can see the end of the profiles here. We turn off the concrete. We've automatically associated all of the rebar and probably not appropriate, but if you wanted to show the ties, you, know, you, you could have that level of detail associated to this. And that becomes important because as we think about the life cycle of the design and all the things that we can do with it, you have to take a step back and think, literally every single component that is designed, fabricated, installed, maintained, can live in this model and be generated automatically. So as I'm looking at the amount of concrete in this, it's not a rule of thumb. I'm not saying we have you know, X distance times a volume to get my quantities. I'm actually pulling a spot on you know, quantity to take off bill of materials of every component necessary. So as we step back to the dashboard, obviously, since it's an integrated view of data, that information is automatically updated in the, the 3D view. And again, even on our viewer, it's carrying that level of detail. And so we can drill in from I think we said 44 kilometers of rail earlier, all the way down to the connection of two pieces of rebar and have that level of detail, that scalability all in this environment and not have to rely on, again, extracted quantities and, and pieces that are broken off so that we can articulate a higher level of value. So at this point, my colleague has said the conceptual design's done, not sure about uh, these things on the layout, but hey, we, we assumed three meters for, for this breakdown and you know, here's the design. So my colleague now, back on the other side of the, uh, the fence, gets the update and now he has a task that's been assigned to this activity. And he can get the feedback, hey, conceptual design's done, not sure about it, but we're looking at the three meter depth. Well, as Olivier hinted at earlier, uh, the unthinkable changes and uh, you know, there is a design change. And so they've come back after a structural review and said, we only need two and a half meters. We can you know, eliminate the use of material, it's gonna save on costs. This is what we want to do. So that then gets acted, sent back and communicated. In this case, it's, since it's a change, it's always of a high urgency. And then we have a new date associated for that, uh, that return. So at this point, back on the design side, we get that update. We have you know, the option to send an email in addition to updating the dashboard. And we can start uh, looking at all the tasks that we have here. 
So at this point, we can note the comment after review. We need to change the depth. Okay, so we go back. And at this point, we're going to modify the pattern. And so looking at this, you can see where conceptually we downgraded the level of detail on the concrete. We left the steel here just for visibility. But you have that ability to be able to go from a level of detail 200 to level 500, down to 300, back up to 400, over whatever is appropriate for the actions that you're taking and the people that you're communicating with. So at this point, we're going to select and apply that new pattern to shorten the depth. And you can see where that's happened now. And again, because we left the steel alone, you can see the distinction of that half meter. Well, we could have done this together in one step, but it's a simple matter now, after the fact, to come back in, apply a new pattern, and have that update again automatically to, to recalculate all of the context of the, of the structural system of the rebar in this case, to update with the new depth that we have. And again, as we look to the interior, you have every single piece necessary to be installed. You have accurate quantities, even down to a removal of the voids for the concrete. And as we're carrying that or sharing that information back, we can actually create a series of if you will, 2D and 3D markups to share with them. So in this case, the 3D markups are creating snapshots, if you will, but the snapshots are linked again to the model. So we're always going back to that camera point, that vantage point, that, you know, that view to be able to make sure that we're in the right place to do the right thing with this information. So by creating a series of, of these capture views, we can add annotations, add whatever information we want. You know, job's been done. Take a look at this uh, this depth, this layout, this space, whatever the case may be, and link that back into my task, at which point we've identified it as being resolved. Modifications have been performed. Take a look at the markups. See if this is what you're thinking. Okay. Now, since this was a last minute deal, this is probably quite late in the day. So as I put that back for review and send it back to my colleague, Chances are he may have left the office, but you know, sitting at home in front of the television or whatever people do when they're not at work, um, going into the mobile device, again, through the web browser, we're able to look in and access all of this tasks and all of the history. So at that point, we can select the activity, we can look at the geometry, we can look at the, uh, the activities, and then we can search. If we have additional information that maybe we're not clear on, we have a number of different ways to be able to access and index all this project information. So by going and looking at the title of an actor or an activity or a component, you know, however we want to find that information, it becomes available to us. And so at that point, since we have this kit of parts, if you will, this package that we're looking at to verify and validate the uh, changes that we made, we can come in and review that. We can associate it. And of course, as Tomas work always is, it's absolutely perfect. So we can identify that. And then that becomes part of the history of this project. So the activity has been closed, but as I mentioned earlier, a month, three months, a year, some amount of time downstream, if we need to come back and say, who made this change? We can identify who did it. We can then say, well, why did they make the change? And we can actually see that history of all the conversation, all the attachments and all the data, even the, the email going all the way back to the owner, the voice recording of the, the conference call, whatever the case is that's attached to that task, that activity, that object, to have that traceability to know everything about this project that we want to know. So that being said, I've been talking here for a lot longer than I thought I might, but I want to uh, save a little bit of time for Q&A, and I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Fred for uh, the next section of our discussion. But before I do that, I just want to drill home one last time that within the 3D experience, we're looking to expand beyond BIM. We want to take that BIM and engage with the entire, entire experience. Typically, we find that the BIM is the what. We're capturing the who, the why, the when, and the how to go along with that and making that all integrated in a very easy to, to consume capacity to provide you with traceability to minimize risk. And again, we're doing that from end to end across the entire construction space from the components all the way up to the campus more than the entire city. So with that being said, Fred, I appreciate the time and I'm gonna uh, hand this back over to you. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Olivier. So it's great to have a passionate speaker, but <laughs> we're behind schedule now for a Q&A. Uh, so 
I'm going to try to consolidate some of the questions that we had, uh, and I will maybe take uh, the first one, which is basically, uh, you know, data-driven question mark. So what do we mean by data-driven? So I, we're, we stated that early on because we want to make it in opposition, I would say, to document-based environments. Other people are talking about platforms, seamless data integration. But in the end, what they're managing is document. And basically, a document is a black box with a lot of data that is not accessible. So when we're saying that we have a data-driven platform is because we're able to make data explicit, connect them in a, you know, a easy fashion without any methodology, without tagging, linking, mapping, or publishing. And basically, that means that you can put in place a digital thread quickly and that you know you you're better able to manage change along your project lifecycle because you have higher granularity um, uh, of the information that is accessible. So that's one of the first question. Uh, the other one I think would be relevant. I, I, I will send it to you, uh, Kurt. So quick heads up here, and I will expand it a little bit. So the question was. Uh, uh, can we collaborate also outside our organization? So, so I would expand by adding, can we do this type of collaboration that you've shown, Kurt, with uh, suppliers, operation and owners, uh, program manager uh, companies? Yes, well, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's one of the pieces. Again, as I look at the history of, of Dassault and their development of the 3D experience, early on there was an acknowledgement and a, you know, recognizing that not everybody's using the same tool, the same version of the same tool. There are a number of, as Fred mentioned, point solutions in the industry that are, are very capable of doing discrete tasks. And so as you've invested in the time to become an expert with that tool, there's absolutely no reason that we shouldn't leverage that information. So if I have a supplier that's um, you know, coordinating with me as far as when things are going to be delivered to the job site or what components might be available as design choices. You know, that's something where we can consume the information that they're using or we could potentially expose part of the, the data source here for them to be able to come on board, engage and work within our environment. It, it really boils down to, uh, to the workflow at the end of the day that they want to engage in. But absolutely, I mean, we want to be able to provide as much flexibility to support as many people as possible within this integrated environment to help, I'd say, eliminate a lot of the waste and redundancy that we have today in, in the construction market. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, the other question, uh, maybe uh, we'll start with you, Olivier. So uh, the question was with relation to um, how to uh, how do you select it? How did you define the scope of usage of 3D experience at the SNC Savannah? I mean, uh, generally speaking, we can uh, closely do uh, everything. Uh, but in um, in a project, for example, we, you work uh, with uh, partners, and uh, it depends uh, how the contract is uh, is shared uh, in between uh, all uh, the people. But uh, honestly, you can do whatever you want, and. You, you, you can share whatever you want. Um, we did a lot also of uh, research and development for electrical with uh, the RFLP, so the connection in between uh, schematic and uh, 3D. And uh, it's uh, it's fantastic. But uh, on, on the project I work now, uh, the, 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 the team who was in charge that didn't have uh, 3DX. So, uh, we we do not have the, the opportunity to use it in a real uh, context. So, thank you, uh, thank you, Olivier. So it's a really quick Q and A session. Uh, there's more to it. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I commit to reach out to you individually and uh, provide answer to your question. Um, what before we're closing the session, what I would like first to thank you, uh, Kurt, and you, Olivier, for for sharing your expertise today. I hope that the audience enjoyed and found the session informative. Again, please feel free to to provide comment. If you can go to the next slide, maybe, uh, Kurt. So uh, please take time to share your opinion on this first webinar of the Beyond BIM series. 
provide feedback on the LinkedIn post that we use to promote this event. So the intent is that we can collectively benefit from your feedback, share your thoughts, what you like, what you think was missing um, from your perspective. Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available shortly. I will also send uh, an e-booklet so that you can share and discuss with your colleagues so that maybe that will lead to more questions, confirm your interest or trigger new disc discussion. Uh, I will add also some additional videos so you can better relate to some of the content for tunnel design, for example, and also provide insight on what we can do from an asset management perspective. And at last, reach out to me if you have any questions and comments. You've seen in a lot today. Um, Olivier mentioned earlier that, you know, an evaluation for a bidding process for a project of 44 kilometers of railways can be done in 400 man hours. So, I mean, of course, I'm for being more efficient and be innovative, and I think you should be as well, right? So, like Olivier mentioned uh, in his conclusion, dare to be curious. There's nothing better than, uh, you know, living and trying uh, new process and technology. So, feel free to reach out to me. Let's discuss and let's play with food experiences. It's that simple. So, on this, um, well, thank you for joining us today, and have a good day.